Okay, welcome everybody. It's two o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Julia Myers and I'll be hosting this webinar for the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. We are super excited for this webinar today, Surprising Native Bees of Pinellas County. It will be presented by Ms. Liz Childress, who is the educator and outreach specialist for the Wing Island Preserve. And she's also an insect expert, and we are really excited to see what she has in store for us. Quickly, I will just go over a little housekeeping. Um, if you have any comments throughout the presentation today, please feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring that, um, and you can communicate with me on any issues you may be having with Zoom. And if you have a question on anything um, that Liz is covering in the presentation, please put that in the Q&A box and then she will answer all of your questions at the very end. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to you, Liz, and we'll go ahead and get started. Alrighty. Well, again, I'm Liz Childress with Wheaton Island, and I am so honored to be joining um, Brooker Creek, my colleagues at Brooker Creek for their Wednesday webinar series. And we're gonna discuss um, the surprising native bees of Pinellas County and how we can appreciate our tiny wildlife. Um, this particular program is a companion piece to one that James did last week, his uh, plants and practices to pamper pollinators. And in this presentation, we're going to be learning about who our native bees are, a little bit about their lifestyles, and some about how to ID that bee, and then a little bit about how to pleasantly surprise our native bees. Uh, these bees right here are uh, there are uh, native Calides bees, those are cellophane bees, and these are little males. They're just about the size of a rice grain, and they're just waking up. Um, they slept all night on this beautiful blazing star flower, and now uh, we're going to get to talk to them, or talk to them. We're going to get to meet them and learn about them a little more later in the presentation. Before we go on, I just want to let you all know that um, Pinellas County is a bee city USA. Um, that means the county is committed to providing education and signage and um, all manner of support um, for our native bees um, to make sure that we have the right habitats for them and that we promote their conservation. Alrighty, you ready to get started? Let's go. Okay, who are our native bees? Let's do a lineup and we will determine which one of these contestants are native bees. So if you would, uh, if you want, you can put your comments in the chat as we uh, determine, we're gonna go through each one, one by one. And if you determine that, um, you can put your determinations in the chat um, if you think it's a native bee or not, and or just not think about it in your head. So let's get started, whoops, with contestant number one. Okay, contestant number one, is this a native bee? Give you a few seconds to think about that. We've got a yes in there. Let's see, anyone else? Alrighty, well, let's find out. Yes, this is a native bee. Um, this is the Poe's burrow bee. It's quite common here in Pinellas. Um, uh, we see them a lot in our yards and parks, and that is a native bee. So let's move on to contestant number two. So who is this in our little stripy jacket here? Is this a native bee or not? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. We have one comment that says, I see all bees here. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the trick is native bees. Let's find out about contestant number two. This isn't a bee. This is called a plush back fly. Um, if Wayfair sold flies, they would sell the plush back. I love the name, plush back. Um, this is one that's common on our plants. Um, this spring, I was looking at the salt palmetto bloom at Wheaton Island, and we had all kinds of bees and wasps and flies all over those uh, flowers, just feeding and having a big time. We also had a whole bunch of brown anoles. And those lizards were snaffling up every little non-stripy thing they could find. And I noticed they left our plush backs alone. So wearing a stripy jacket is a very good defense against predators. All right, let's move to contestant three. Native bee or not? Give you a few seconds. Ready? 
This is not a native bee. It's our beloved Western honeybee. And they actually are not native to the United States or North American. We'll talk about a little bit more about them um, in a minute, but um, our Western honeybees, they're not native. Alrighty, now contestant number four. What do you think? Okay, you ready? Yes, this is a native bee. This is a sharp tail bee. It's one of the cuckoo bees. And again, we're gonna learn more about them in just a minute. Um, and they tend to not be fuzzy and hairy um, like uh, we, I used to think bees were all fuzzy and hairy. Um, they're a lot more wasp-like um, because they don't have to collect pollen because they live a cuckoo lifestyle. Again, we'll learn more about that in just a sec. Okay, so let's see where our bees fit in with the tree of life. So here we've got the tree of life, starting at the bottom with uh, single-celled organisms called protista. And we branch up here, we can see our vertebrates with mammals and birds and fish. And then if we go up here for the arthropods, we see spiders and millipedes and insects. Bees are insects. So they are arthropods and they are insects. And they are in the class Insecta. Um, you might be familiar with some of these other classes of insects. Our orders of insects, we've got beetles and butterflies and moths, true bugs, flies, and ants, bees, and wasps, Hymenoptera. So there they are. They are in this um, insect order called Hymenoptera, and uh, that means membrane winged, according to some sources, and their wings do have membranes on them, so it kind of makes sense. So let's dig a little deeper. Oh my, look at this. This is a complicated science diagram. And this is showing you all of the super families. These are ne the next subdivision in Hymenoptera. And I remember first seeing this and looking around, I'm looking for some word in here. I mean, there's a lot of Latin words in here. I'm looking for something that means bees and I couldn't come up with anything. I did see this one, this is the formicoidea. And I know ants use formic acid. Remember, I'm a bug nerd, so I know these things. But I don't see anything about bees. So what's up with the bees? Where are the bees? They're supposed to be here. They are but they're buried. They're in this family of wasps called Apoidea. Huh, so what does that mean? Yes, bees are actually vegetarian wasps. There's nothing special or different about them and the rest of the wasps, they are just vegetarian. And it's thought that they evolved from their closest genetic relatives, which are called thrips wasps. And if I have any gardeners out there, um, you're probably familiar with thrips. They are tiny, tiny little bugs that get into flower buds and wreak havoc. And uh, the thrips wasp will um, use those uh, particular thrips as food. And it's thought that perhaps ancestral bees or these wasps um, got to thinking, well, shoot, there's pollen in here. This is a great source of protein and we don't have to chase it down or find it. Let's just use that. So that's one of the current theories about how bees evolved uh, to be vegetarian wasps. How about that? Okay. So we've learned that bees are just a subset of wasps. So how do you tell the difference? Remember meeting that sharp-tailed bee and it just looked like a wasp and it didn't have hairs or anything? Um, as it turns out, it's kind of subtle to tell the difference between wasps and bees. Um, I was thinking that there's got to be some characteristic when you're out in the field and you're looking at a bunch of things buzzing around on some flowers, you can easily tell. Sometimes you really can't. Um, the way to tell has to do with their legs. And this is the last, the little last segment of their leg. It's called a tarsus. It's kind of like the long part of our foot. There's a segment right here, the first segment of the tarsus that on bees is longer and maybe a little wider than it is on wasps. See how similar these insects look? This one's got kind of a, just a regular little um, section right here. And this one, the bee has a kind of a long section right there of the first part of its lower leg. Also, if we look down here, bees have hairs that have little bristles on them, and wasps have smooth hairs. This is a close-up picture of bee hairs right here, and I got to thinking about this. I was looking at these pictures saying, how am I going to see this in the field when I'm out looking at, again, these things buzzing around? The answer is I'm really not, so there's going to be a little bit of guesswork when it comes to telling bees and wasps apart, 
Um, most of the time, you can kind of figure it out with uh, the bees are remarkably hairier, but now you can kind of know the secret that they're not all like that. Okay, now we learned in our lineup that honeybees aren't native bees. Well, how can that be? We hear about saving the bees. Well, honeybees, as we all know, are vitally important to our food sources. Um, we got to do everything we can to help them. They are not native to North America. They're native to Europe. And they're really considered livestock, um, kind of like chickens and cows and all that. Um, honeybees, again, had experienced some problems. And that is not good news for us. However, there's been progress made on many fronts um, in working with honeybees. Um, they, honeybees have an advocacy, advocacy organization called Agriculture that is actively working to figure out how to keep them safe and keep them producing and all that good stuff. Um, so honeybees have their own built-in um, advocacy, advocacy group and they also have their own built-in PR firm. Our native bees really don't have that. So that kind of falls on us to be advocates for our native bees. So I hope you understand a little bit more about the honeybees and the native bees. Oh, and by the way, honeybees, have y'all tried palmetto honey? That's my favorite kind of honey. I love it when it comes out. Um, it's buttery and wonderful. And if you ever see some, uh, give it a try. It's good. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the lifestyles of the tiny and buzzy of our little bees. All righty, here is their life cycle. Bees and wasps undergo complete metamorphosis like butterflies. Um, they go from a lay, an egg to a little larva to a pupa and then an adult that looks nothing like the first life stages, um, just like butterflies. Um, but what is different about butterflies and moths, actually the moths that include butterflies, is that mama bee almost always provisions food for her babies and makes sure they have something to eat when they're larvae. And something else that's kind of different is that um, uh, bees have the pupa that have little legs. Um, they actually have little projections from the pupal case um, that have their legs in them, which really surprised me because I'm used to butterfly chrysalises and moth cocoons. And when you look at the pupa of a butterfly or a moth, um, there's no legs. It's just one little capsule. But for uh, bees and wasps and ants, they have these little legs that come out of their pupa. And I thought that was really kind of neat. Okay, um, now let's talk about nesting. So how do they get started with this life cycle? How do they start the next generation? Um, some of our native bees, most of them are solitary. Um, that means that they nest by themselves. The females uh, find a nest and do their thing and provision it all by themselves. But we do have some that are primitively social. And what that means is that they have colonies that are for the most part are annual. That means they last for a year or so. And they are started by what is known as a foundress. Um, bumblebees have foundresses, and we'll talk a little bit about some of our tiny sweat bees that also are colonial and have foundresses. A foundress is a female bee that hatches late in the season and she will hibernate over the winter. And then in the spring, she'll come out and she will start a colony. I think that's kind of fun term, foundress. And I think many of you might be aware that our bumblebees um, have these uh, colonies and they do live together. But this tiny poey sweat bee, or not tiny, they're about maybe a third smaller than a honeybee. Um, they can be social too, not always. Sometimes they are solitary and sometimes they will live in small colonies, much like bumblebees. Um, I haven't seen anything that really indicates what conditions make them do that. I think that might still be um, undergoing some research. I thought that was really neat that those little poey furrow bees in my yard could possibly have a colony somewhere. I've been looking and so far they've been very good at hiding where they're at. Most of our uh, bees are ground nesters and they nest in burrows underground. Um, whether they dig them or they use other burrows, um, they are ground nesters. And this is showing another one of our sweat bees and she's coming out of her tunnel there. This diagram is showing you a cross section of a mining bee nest. And mining bees are very good diggers, as you can guess from the name. And they're able to dig deep tunnels and put little cells um, off these tunnels and have their babies be in a very safe spot um, to grow up. 
And many of these can be several feet deep. And it's amazing that such a tiny little insect can dig such amazing uh, burrows. Another place bees nest, and this is something that I had no idea about when I first got into this. Um, they nest in stems. How about that? This is a small carpenter bee, a serotina bee. And you can see her at the end of a stem and it looks hollow. Um, bees that nest in stems pick certain plants that have pith in the middle of them. Um, that's a soft sub substance that they can dig through. They'll find um, stems that have been broken off or burnt and get into those and dig out the pith. If you look at this diagram here, what a bee that's been hatched out in the late summer will do is uh, she will find a suitable stem and she'll dig herself a little place, a little cell where she can hibernate over the winter. And then when it's the right time to come out, she will dig that cell down deeper and start building cells for her young. And you can see we've got, um, this is showing a pollen ball that she's put in there. We'll talk more about those uh, later. And then like the little larva, this is the oldest bee here and then the next oldest and so on and so on. And I got to thinking about this with them, them nesting in, in stems and I thought, hmm, how did they get out? And I just said, well, gosh, it's anyone knows they probably just chew a hole and leave, yay. But they don't. This particular kind of bee, um, the first one that hatches, of course, is the oldest one. And what this oldest bee will do is go up to this little cap right here and chew through it and kind of chew the whole thing up and push it down to the bottom of the burrow and then move the pupa or the bee down here. And then it'll go up here and do the same, move everything down, go up here, do the same, move it down. And then it will rest at the top and wait for everybody to turn into their final forms. And then they will all leave together. That's pretty amazing. I cannot believe these little bees do that. And the um, account of their nesting that I was reading says it takes about eight days for this um, oldest bee to make her way or his way up to the top. And all while this is going on, uh, the study was saying that the female bee will stay, that original mother bee will stay up here and do her best to guard her babies. So how about that for parental care? I love it. All right, next, um, you can see what's going on here. This surprisingly is a leaf cutter bee and she's busy cutting a little section out of a leaf. Do you remember, you've probably seen this in your garden. I remember seeing like, perfect half circles out of leaves. And I was just thinking, gosh, those are really neat caterpillars, um, but they're not. Those holes were made by these little bees. And they were using them to carry to a nest site and build a little lining in a hole in wood or under bark so they can have a tunnel to put their babies in. This is showing one of these tunnels with a cap of a leaf. And this is showing how the tunnel looks if you were to take it out of the, um, of, of the hole. It's all those leaves that she gets when she is doing her clipping, she rolls them in a ball, and inside here will be several cells of her babies. And so I have learned as a gardener to really, I'm fine and actually honored when I see the little half round holes in my garden's plants, because that means that we have leaf cutter bees, mama leaf cutter bees busy doing their thing. So I hope that that can happen for you too. All righty, now we're gonna switch gears to what bees eat. Um, we've been talking about, you've seen, been seeing pictures of these yellow balls inside the cells where these bees are, are uh, growing up. Um, this particular tunnel we're looking at belongs to a mason bee who used uh, dirt and cemented together with secretions to uh, make a tunnel, make a, a little burrow and make cells in between each of these little rooms that she'll put a pollen ball and lay an egg on. And she knows exactly how much pollen she's got to carry and get and she also mixes it with some saliva and some other stuff to make sure that it's, it's good for the babies. Maybe um, has a little bit of antimicrobial properties so that the baby will have something really nice to eat as it gets ready to turn into a pupa. But they provision their cells with these pollen balls. And that's why our bees are out gathering so much pollen and why they're, they're good pollinators. They just have to do that to continue on with the next generation. So what do the adults eat? Well. The adults will eat a little bit of pollen, but they mostly eat nectar. And the flowers that they can nectar from um, depend a lot on the bee's anatomy, particularly their tongue. If a bee has a long tongue, it can reach deep into the neck of flowers to get at the sweet nectar reward down here. 
Um, you can just stick that little tongue right down there and lap it up. If you've got a bee with a small tongue or just a small bee, it's going to have to look for flowers that have um, shorter lengths to getting to the, the nectar reward. Like this, this is a sunflower right here. A lot of our daisy-like composites are perfect for bees like that. Now, tiny bees also have a bit of an advantage. Sometimes they can just put their whole selves in here and um, get to the nectar. And occasionally, uh, some bees will take a shortcut and they will be what's called nectar thieves. I've seen carpenter bees do this, where they'll just dig a hole or chew a hole through this part of the flower and get right to the nectar here. And we say they're being nectar thieves because they didn't go past the pollen bearing parts of the flower to get pollen to bring to another flower. Sneaky. Okay. And here is a, yet another lifestyle of the tiny and buzzy. Um, these are cuckoo bees. Oh, I talked a little bit about those with our lineup when we saw that pointy wasp looking little bee. So these cuckoo bees have a, um, a very interesting lifestyle. What they do is they have specific other bees that they'll watch. And when a parent bee is not guarding her hole or she's not there, bees will sneak in and lay an egg on one of the little pollen balls that the other bee has provided for its young. And when that egg hatches into a new little cuckoo bee larva, it will destroy the other cuckoo, the other host bee's larva, and then take the pollen ball all for itself. Um, these three species are relatively common. Um, I have this one in my yard, these longhorn cuckoo bees. Um, we also see quite a bit of these fervid nomad bees. And these guys, um, uh, probably do get onto sweat bees and mining bees. The longhorn cuckoo bees um, go after longhorn bees. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. They're among my favorites. And the sharp tail bees, um, again, will go after leaf cutter bees. This one's gray. It's funny. Um, a lot of our leaf cutter bees are gray. So um, that's just kind of interesting. So these are our cuckoo bees. And they don't have hairs or baskets for their pollen anywhere on their bodies because they really don't need them because they really don't collect pollen. They go to the flowers for the nectar rewards. Make sense? Everybody with me? Okay. Here are some more cuckoo bees. These are little bitty ones. Um, these are blood bees. And our blood bees uh, look for sweat bees and mining bees. And they hang out where they find these bees nesting. This little bee is waiting for a chance to go in one of these holes and lay her egg. As you can see, the owners of these burrows are like, no, I don't think so. But she'll bide her time and uh, she'll probably make it into one or two and be able to lay some eggs. Um, this uh, beautiful picture from a bee researcher that we work closely with, Clint Gibson, is of, of a fiery cyclops bee. This is a gorgeous bee that we actually have here in Pinellas County. Um, I've seen this particular species at Eagle Lake Park and at Largo Central Nature Reserve, and I have also seen them at Brooker Creek. Um, at Brooker Creek, we got to watch two species of blood bees at a colony. I think they were of um, uh, little bitty fairy mining, bee, mining bees, or no, no, I, my apologies. They were of the small carpenter bees. There's a bunch of um, nesting holes of these little bitty carpenter bees, and uh, the blood bees were scrambling about trying to find a way in. And it was fascinating to be able to watch that. I felt so privileged. Okay. Now, let's turn our attention to how do we ID that bee? We're looking around in our gardens, at our parks and the flowers and the native plants that we have, and we see bees buzzing around. How do we tell them apart? Well, let's learn. Okay. The first thing we're gonna talk about is search image. And that is something that bees use to find um, a particular flower. Like um, I, for those of you who have done any of the pollinator programs with James, um, he talks about bees quite a bit where uh, bees and other pollinators will have a search image. They'll go out, they'll find a flower that has the right kind of pollen and they'll say, all right, this is the right kind of flower for me to have. So I am going to go to all these different flowers that look like this because I know I can get what I need from those particular flowers. So bees use that. People use it too. And I'm thinking like for me, if I go into a city that I don't, don't know very well and I want a cup of coffee, I, I like Dunkin' Donuts. So I'll be looking for that logo and that's my search image and I'll be able to pick it out um, among all the other signs that are in, a, in the city. So I'll be able to find it. 
and how we apply search image to looking for insects is scaling down what we're looking at and looking for small things. And since I've been doing that, it's just been amazing. There's so much interesting tiny wildlife to be seen. So when we start our journey and looking for bees and learning how to identify that, the first thing we have to do is get a small search image um, to be able to look for them. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at a field of flowers and going, oh, okay, there's just nothing there. And then as I look at it more and more and I think about it, I can start to see it come to life. So we got to get our search image on for our tiny wildlife. Now, how to see a bee? Where do we look? Well, easy. First thing, flowers. We know bees are going to be going to flowers. Now, this is a prickly pear cactus flower at Whedon Island. And here you can see some bees going for it. We've got a, a leaf cutter bee here and then a, a tiny little sweat bee up in there. So we all know we need to look for flowers, but there's other places we can look for bees, like on the ground and bare spots. Sometimes we can be lucky enough to uh, find a bee going into or out of her burrow. Um, and sometimes our bees will nest in aggregations, which is, for me, is really cool. And uh, let me uh, tell you a story about uh, a bee aggregation. I got word that there was a lot of bees flying around at Fred Howard Park. And they were flying very low. And I went to look at them. And I found out that it was a nesting aggregation of of uh, longhorn bees. And these bees were not interested in people. It was, I guess, a sort of alarming to see all these bugs flying around, but they were all on the ground. And as I watched them, I actually, all right, I, I laid down on the ground to take pictures of them and was watching. And um, just as an aside, the bees that are solitary don't defend their colonies. Um, they just don't. I found out that I was actually like on one of their burrows and I felt terrible about that. That lady bee was so happy um, for me to be able to finally get off her burrow so she could get in there. And, um, but they're not aggressive at all. They're just too busy provisioning their um, burrows and there were males flying around looking for females and all that other good stuff. And the bee that I was looking at was this one. This is a longhorn bee. This is a male longhorn bee. And um, this is a male longhorn bee cuckoo. We see them roosting together. And this is another place to look for bees. If you look for dead flower heads, particularly um, in the late afternoon, in the spring, summer, and fall when it's a uh, bee season, you can find these little guys sleeping and it's really fun. So I think they're really cute when they sleep. The male bees will kind of sleep in small groups and they grab onto the stems with their mouths. Look at this, look at the feet all up in the air and they just hold on with their faces. And it's cute to see sleeping bees. I'm always very careful not to disturb them because I don't want to wake them up. Um, they need their rest because they've got a whole busy day coming up. So these are places to look for to see bees. One, pretty easy, look for flowers. Two, mm, look on the ground. And three, look on little dead seed heads. As we're looking at bees, if you want to identify them to the family, um, there's um you can look at different parts of the bees and that will help you. Um, this diagram is showing us the different parts of bees, different parts of their legs, um, where their pollen basket is and where their eyes are. Sometimes the eyes can be a good clue as to um, what kind of bee you've got there. So that's a way to look is um, study the bee and what does it look like? What do its different parts look like? And here, I just had to put this picture here. Uh, again, as you're looking at the legs to see if maybe this part or this part has different kinds of markings. This is our leg up close. And here we can see this part. This is the whole lower leg that I was talking about earlier that has the um, uh, bees have that big, the first segment, the basitarsis is bigger. You can really see it here um, that it's bigger than the rest of it. And then it's got a tibia and then the femur. And what's in between the tibia and the femur? The knee. And I thought this was just very, very cute. Um, for those of you familiar with the saying, it's the bee's knees, meaning something that's really good. Well, bees really do have knees, and that's what a bee's knee looks like. Okay, now, identifying bees to the species. I don't know if we have any birders out there, but I, I'm a birder, and I very much enjoy looking at birds. And um, if I have a good photograph and um, some guidebooks and online resources and maybe um, consulting the uh, What's That Bird Facebook group, I can pretty much figure out what species of bird I have. So I came into looking at bees thinking, well, I'll probably with pictures and, and maybe a little bit of help, I can figure out what species it is. 
And I started looking at this key called, it's in Discover Life, about how you can find out the species and you can start out with like figuring out where it was from, what color the hair is, and does it have contrasting? Oh, this is getting pretty hairy here with lots of science. Oh no. And I looked down here, a way to really tell these apart, we're looking at um, different kinds of leaf cutter bees, is the shape of this tiny little piece on the end of their rear ends, at the end of their abdomen. Okay, look at that. And these are all different. And I realized that I'm really not gonna be able to identify our leaf cutter bees to species without two things, maybe three things. One, I need to have a very good knowledge of insect anatomy down to the details I didn't even know bees had. All of their little segments have names and you've got to know what those names are and you have to know what to look for. The second thing you need is a microscope. You need a microscope to see some of these distinguishing characteristics. And the third thing that's very handy that even bee experts do is fellow bee experts. And um, you can access them on iNaturalist. If you put your um, sighting up there, uh, the bee experts will get in there and help you uh, figure out what you have. Again, for some of them, you put them on iNaturalist, they won't be able to get the species because of photographs, even good macro photographs. Um, you can't quite get to the um, detail that you need to tell which species is which, which is kind of neat. So I've kind of learned with insects in general um, to be able to satisfy uh, my need to identify something where I can be satisfied with the family, uh, the genus, something along those lines. I'm currently taking a course called WASP ID, and that's really neat. It's an in-depth entomology course, and you're gonna we're learning to identify the different superfamilies of wasps. And one of the things that stuck with me that one of the researchers said about a feature on this tiny wasp was, um, you can see it better with an electron scanning microscope. And that's when I looked at it and thought, oh, I'm out. I don't know if I can do that. Not with the equipment that I have. So again, I've been learning a lot of um, different things as I have journeyed in my uh, quest to learn more about insects and identifying the species is one of those things that I realized that I just may not be able to get to myself. Okay, so let's switch gears. That was the how, and now we're gonna move to the what. Here are some common Pinellas bee families. We're going to go through those and, and talk a little bit about them. Um, we've got a family called Apidae, and that has our bumblebees, our carpenter bees, our little longhorn bees, and um, honeybees are in this particular family, and they tend to be fuzzy, and um, they're pretty cool. We've got lots of this particular family in Pinellas County. Um, look at this bumblebee. That's kind of fun. Another common family we have are sweat and furrow bees. Remember this little friend? This is our, whoops, this is our Poe's um, furrow bee and covered in pollen. Um, this is a sweat bee in Helictidae. And this is a green sweat bee right here. So we've got lots of sweat and furrow bees. And we have leaf cutter bees and mason bees. What's really cool about this family is that instead of carrying their pollen on their legs, they carry it in a special place under their abdomen. They have a little hair basket under there and they put all the pollen, they dig it up. It's so fun to watch them do that. If you find one of these bees on a flower, they'll be just digging that pollen and shoving it up in this um, little basket of hairs they have. And uh, my colleagues at Brooker Creek um, say that they look like they have loaded diapers when they fly. And I think they're right. And they call them diaper bees. And I do that now too, because it does look like they have a diaper. And I think this is a sweet little diaper bee here. And this is one of our leaf cutter bees. And um, this little bee right here is a mason bee. And these are both found in Pinellas County. Now with the leaf cutter bees, this is one of the um, families that is really difficult to identify the species without a microscope and a knowledge of bee anatomy. Okay, we also have um, some cellophane bees in Pinellas County. These usually are very little. Um, there are some bigger cellophane bees that live north of here um, in the scrub. There's a giant scrub plasterer bee, and that bee is um, about the size of a bumblebee. But for the most part, the bees that we see here, our cellophane bees, are little, like really little. This is a palmetto blossom, and this is the Greenwich's masked bee. Um, we found these at Whedon Island, and I was just so excited to find them in, in the, uh, the saw palmetto blossoms. 
Um, what I learned about looking at little bees, um, I've got to credit Clint Gibson for getting me to get my search image on for little bees, is that you pay close attention to all those little natty things that are flying around. A lot of the little gnats that you see around um, flowers are bees. And if you look at enough of them, you'll start to get a feel like they fly a little bit different than the flies that are around there. They move a little bit differently. Um, but that's really neat. I had no idea that we had so many little bees. We also had little um, cellophane bees, the Kalides bees. And where they get their name from, and this is pretty wild, they line their nest with cellophane or polyester that they make in their little mouths with secretions. And that keeps those uh, particular bees, um, that keeps their burrows um, waterproofed and um, safe for the babies. And they also don't have a whole lot of hairs to carry their um, their uh, uh, pollen. Like the mass bees will eat the pollen and keep it in a little crop, and then they bring it into a burrow. And that's where they make a little pollen, their pollen ball. And it's actually more less of a pollen ball and more of like a pollen gel for their babies to eat. I see we have a raised hand. Okay. All right, well, anyway, let's keep going. Another um, bee family have in Pinellas is our fairy bees, um, our mining bees. We have fairy bees, and then we have mining bees. Again, these particular bees, mining bees can be quite big, but the ones that we have in Pinellas are small. These are the bees that we learned about earlier that make these extensive tunnels that they keep their, um, that they use to um, uh, keep their babies safe while the babies grow up underground and they can be several feet deep, several feet deep. Um, this particular kind of a mining bee is called a fairy bee, and it is in the genus Perdita. And we have those, they can be common in certain areas where the soil is just right for them. And then this bee is called the smooth-faced or miserable mining bee. What a terrible name. Now I can probably tell you that this particular specimen is miserable because it's in a container right now. It hasn't been let go, so it probably is miserable. But I was looking around to try to find some information about how are these um, particular bees, um, um, why do they, why, why, why are they named miserable mining bees? And there's really nothing out there <laughs> that says that. Um, what's interesting again about mining bees is that it's thought that they might be attracted to particular soil types. And this particular bee, um, I don't know if it's been found in Pinellas or not, but I know that um, bee researchers are looking to see if we have the right soil types for that and then looking to see if colonies are there. Something else that's pretty neat about these bees is they'll nest in pretty good sized aggregations and their nesting is timed with the red maple tree. And they are dependent on the bloom of the red maple. And our red maples are blooming about now. Some of them are in full flower, and some of them are even past at this point. And it's going to be interesting to see if any of our mining bee colonies, um, if they're going to be out and looking for um, the red maple trees. Again, they're specialists. This particular subspecies of the mining bees um, is a specialist and is um, looks for the red maple flowers um, to get its pollen and nectar. Really interesting, the connection between the blooming of the maple tree and the emergence of the bees. One of the concerns we have with climate change is that as things change and plants change their blooming times is the concern will bees that depend on certain species of plants change their emergence time. So it'd be awful if these bees came out and the maples were either done or hadn't started yet. They wouldn't have anything to eat and they wouldn't have anything to feed their babies. So there's our mining bees and the ones we have most of the ones we have here are little. Okay, now let's look at bees group um, by, um, group by size. Medium-sized bees, about the size of a honeybee. Um, one of our most common next to our Poe's furrow bee is the brown wing striped sweat bees. This is the female right here, and she is all green. And here's the male, and he is green here, and he's got a beautiful yellow and black striped abdomen. For years, I thought they were different kinds of bees. And I finally found out it's the male and the female, and they look quite different. And that's not at all unusual um, with bees and wasps, that the, the gender, the sexes will look very much different. I bet you've seen these, particularly in an urban area, just about any green bee that is about the size of a honeybee is probably gonna be this species. 
Um, in Pinellas County, we have some very small green ones, and I've never seen one in my yard or in, um, I've seen them in less developed wooded places, but I have not really seen them in the, in like uh, developed suburbs and yards yet. I'm working on my yard with native plants, so maybe I'll get some. Okay, some more medium-sized bees. This is our Poe's furrow bee, again, that we've met several times. And here's a great picture of the leaf cutter bee. And look at that loaded diaper of pollen. Again, these are the bees um, that they cut those little half moon circles out of leaves and line their those their nesting tunnels with those bee um, with those leaves. And so they um, are, are pretty common. I've got them all over my yard. Um, they're hard to identify the species without, again, some specialized knowledge in a microscope. And I like this close-up of the face of these, um, this female Poe's um, furrow bee. Look at the mandibles that she has. These are good for digging out. And they might also be kind of good for defense too. I remember I got to hold a male bee when I was out with, um, with uh, Clint and he was doing some research on a certain kind of bee. And I was able to hold a male bee. And you wonder, how could I hold a male bee? Well, male bees can't sting because the stinger is a modified ovipositor. They just can't do it because they don't lay eggs. Well, anyway, this little bee that I had in my hand had a nice little set of mandibles and he was just trying to bite me and it wasn't making any difference, but I don't blame him because I'm huge and he was so small and he didn't know I was gonna let him go. But that's kind of neat. Look what she can do. She can kind of dig around and burrow and maybe defend her burrow if she needs to. More medium-sized bees. These are our longhorn bees. Um, this is the kind that occasionally will nest in large aggregations, like the one at Fred Howard Park. Howard Park. They are fuzzy and classically bee-looking. Look at this big pollen basket on this lady right here. Um, our our longhorn bees are kind of hard to identify to species, so I kind of leave that to the experts. Um, so. I know I've got longhorn bees. This is a male and he's roosting and see how he's clamped on with his face. Yep. He's sort of holding on maybe a little with his forelegs, but the other legs are just kind of hanging out there. He's just clamped on right there with his face. So these are our longhorn bees and they are very cute and lots of fun to watch as they go around in flowers. Okay, let's talk about big bees. Here's some big bees that we have. We have Southern carpenter bees, Eastern carpenter bees, and bumblebees. So how do we tell the difference? Well, let's start with our carpenter bees. Carpenter bees are um, have shiny abdomens. They are not quite as furry as bumblebees. And this was really hard um, for me to quite understand in the beginning. I remember in Dallas, I chased after carpenter bees a whole bunch of times thinking they were bumblebees until I finally realized, oh no, they're shiny. It's carpenter bees, not bumblebees, but it was so neat to see them. So that's the first thing you look for to tell carpenter and bumblebees apart, fuzzy bottom, not so fuzzy bottom. And we've got two, well, at least two species of large carpenter bees here. Um, this is a southern carpenter bee, and it has, it's dark pretty much the whole thing, um, throughout its whole body, um, on its back. Uh, the eastern carpenter bee is much bigger, well, usually bigger, and it's got all this fluffy yellow hair and a black spot right kind of in the middle of its thorax or midbody. Um, unless you run into um, the southern carpenter bees here at, at, at Weedon Island, like our dotted horsemen. And when they get in there, there's a little pollen. Um, the anthers are up here on the top of the flower, and they get covered in pollen. So everybody's yellow. So you really can't tell. You just kind of use size as a guideline. But it's just really fun to see all the bees just wallowing around in our dotted horsemen going after it. And we also, um, at Weedon and at Brooker, and you have all of these at Brooker, um, we have uh, bumblebees. Um, Brooker has at least three species of bumblebees. You get um, American bumblebee, and then there's two bumblebees that are a little bit smaller that you can see as well. So those are some big bees that we have. And we also have um, something that, another feature of carpenter bees are the males. Now, male carpenter bees have these great big green eyes. Look at the eyes on this thing. They almost come together like a fly on top. When I first saw them, I couldn't understand what I was seeing. This light colored bee and big green eyes, what in the world? But I was looking at male carpenter bees. This is a male Southern carpenter bee. And this bee is another kind of carpenter bee that's been appearing in Florida. And it is a, kind of a I guess a tropical carpenter bee. Um, they're from the subgenus Neoxylocopa, which is a fun word to say. 
and they're really big. They're bigger than the southern carpenter bees, like they're huge. And this is the male, and he is just a yellow teddy bear. And when you see one in your yard or in a park by passion flower, it's just amazing. It's just a big, giant yellow thing. It's as big. It looks like it's as big as a honey, uh, hum hummingbird. The females are really big too. They're just great big black things. And when one comes into the yard or gets near you in a park, you know it. A concern folks have sometimes about carpenter bees is that carpenter bees will sometimes try to nest in the wood on their houses. And um, that's true, they do. But what the carpenter bees are doing is they're creating a nest. They are not eating the wood, they're making the tunnel. In big numbers, it's true. Yes, they could probably do some damage. But in smaller numbers, they really don't. Um, I had lots of them in my house in Atlanta. We had a wooden deck that was, we had lots of them. And it was so fun to watch them. The males would come up to us and just look at us and kind of threaten us almost like, this is my space, you need to get out of here. And uh, it was just lots of fun to watch them. And we let them be because we didn't think they were doing any damage to our house. So if at all possible, if you do find these on a fence post or someplace, um, see if you could let them be. Again, they're not going to be eating your house or eating your deck. They're just simply making a nesting tunnel. And they'll reuse those tunnels um, year to year. Subsequent generations will get in there and use them. And they have great big jaws that let them go through the wood. And, okay. When we look at who is in Pinellas, yes, we have tiny ones as we talked about. We've talked about our blood bees right here. And then we have these small sweat bees. Um, we had our prickly pear cactuses blooming both at uh, Brooker and Wheaton. And in the prickly, care, prickly pear cactus blossoms, because I had trained myself to look for tiny things, I found these little bitty sweat bees. And these are lazy blossom sweat bees, really hard to identify the species, particularly from this picture. You can tell this is one of mine and that's just how it is. Um, but they're just little bitty delights. And again, it's uh, something to remind yourself when you're looking at bees and looking at flowers, uh, think small, because you might be surprised at, at what you can find. Okay, now, as we start to wrap up, we're gonna go over um, some things that we can do to help our native bees. First of all, we gotta know the threats to native bees. And again, we're not talking about honeybees because they have their own different sets of challenges and they have their own industry that's helping them. Um, the threats to our native bees, the biggest one really is um, land use and development. What our native bees need is habitat um, where they can get to their plants that they've evolved with the native flowers, um, where they have places to nest. Remember, 70% of our bees nest in the ground. They need a little bit of open space um, to do those nesting things for them. Um, we also talked about how if a species of bee depends on one kind of flower for use, that um, if climate change changes blooming time, they may not have a flower source if they come out at the wrong time. Now, there is some evidence that bees, if they, are, um, they really like one kind of flower and it's not around, they can maybe transition to another one but they probably don't raise as many young. It's probably not that good for them. So um, this could be a significant problem for our bees as um, it, with climate change. And another issue that they face is invasive and exotic species. Um, some invasive plants can um, crowd out the native species that they've co-evolved with to where they don't have the high quality food sources they need to be successful and to really thrive. So that is something that threatens them. And so what can we do? We talked about the most important thing and it's really habitat. So where can we get habitat? Well, we can start in our yards and we can start in parks. Um, we can leave natural nesting areas um, by leaving uh, places maybe in your yard, a little more hairy, planting a pollinator garden. Um, that could be very helpful to our bees. Leaving bare spots can be helpful to our ground nesting bees. Pine straw is a good mulch for that because it does tend to have little bare spots that the bees can crawl through. I was always taught to use um, uh, use bark mulch and pile it on thick because you want that soil to stay uh, moist, which is a great practice, but it kind of crowds out our bees. So I've had to kind of change my thoughts about how to do gardening in my house and with uh, the mulch. And also with plants, um, if you're planting um, a native plant garden, is being sure that you have plants that are in bloom like in the spring, summer, and fall so that all the bees will have um, blooms to uh, go to um, no matter what season that they're in flight. One of my favorites, as far as uh, blooms are concerned, is Biden's. And that is that little um, Spanish needles. Um, they have those long seeds that get in your socks and take hundreds of years to pick out. 
Um, those things are in bloom almost year round and they attract all kinds of bees. And I've let a little patch of my yard uh, kind of grow up with the, um, the Spanish needles. And I've been so happy with it. I've seen the neatest bees. I've even gotten some really great pictures of sleeping bees on them. And then of course, as you can imagine, bees are insects. And with our yards, uh, the, the judicious use of pesticides is um, something to really, really consider. Um, and being more tolerant maybe of uh, chewed leaves or um, things like that, um, because pesticides that you may be using to kill one kind of a bug that's doing something may also get our bees as well, particularly if you're spraying flowers. So it's something to consider. We all have to make the right decisions for ourselves and for our yards. Well, something else we can do is called a soft landing, and that's leaving your leaves under the trees instead of raking them away. And that provides nesting habitat, um, that will provide places for our uh, founders bees to hide in the winter time so that they can emerge and uh, start new generations. Um, if you leave some sticks there, maybe it'll provide a nesting spot for your um, leaf cutter bees. And then it also is a great spot for all the caterpillars, particularly under oak trees that live there, they can come to the ground and then they can get in the leaves and they can also pupate and become out as the moss and butterflies that they were designed to do, to be the bee, bee hotels. Those have gotten really popular lately. And are they a good idea? Or are they not a good idea? Well, they're kind of neat to have in the yard because you can see them and you can see bees or mason moss going in and out. It's fascinating. And I have, um, I have a bee hotel and I've had it for many years and um, it gets mason wasps in it and I look forward to them hatching every time. Unfortunately, the bee hotel that I have I'm, is not a good one. I can't get the little tubes out. If you're going to put a bee hotel up, you want to be sure you get one where you can take the little nesting tubes out and clean them. And even if their nesting tubes are capped and they have a bee or something inside, you can put them in a little box like this. This is an emergence box and you can take that tube, put it there and then put new tubes in here and kind of clean out the little spots so that the, um, the bees will have a clean place to stay. With a bee hotel, they do require maintenance. Um, it is concentrating a lot of bees um, that may not necessarily nest close together in a small area. And that is, makes it really a fun time for parasites and fungus and predators. So we have to be responsible owners of our bee hotels. That makes sense? Okay, well, as we begin to uh, get wrap up, here's some bee cuteness. There's nothing cuter than bee rear ends. And we've got a nesting bee. She, she's going down into her nesting hole here. And here are some fun leaf cutter bees going into the cactus plants. Again, when the prick prickly pear blooms, if you wanna see lots of cuteness with bee bums, definitely check out the prickly pear. This one has done a face plant and that is just, I just think that's so cute. And here's some more cuteness. Here are two longhorn bees. These are two males and they're sleeping and look at their antennas. They're kind of keeping track of each other. They're holding on with their mouths and they're sound fast asleep. And they're on one of those dead flower head stems that I was telling you about earlier that are kind of good to keep up. So those are some sleeping longhorn bees, males. All righty, it's time for questions. All righty, let's do some questions. Julia? That was wonderful, Liz. Thank you so much. And the bee cuteness at the end was so good. Who can um, resist? It was so good. We do have a few questions. And if anyone else has any questions, now is the time to put them in the chat or in the q and I'm also going to launch a quick poll if you don't mind helping us answer three simple questions so that we can take your feedback and keep making better programs. So our first question is, what is the function of the simple eye versus the compound eye? That's a great question. Um, the compound eyes are made up of a bunch of different little pieces, little eye cells called omnitidia, and they help uh, bees see detail. The compound eyes on the top are really good at detecting kind of light and dark and simple light changes, and they will help the bees detect um, predators. If you look at, um, there's actually, I don't know if we have any in North America, I know there's some in South America and certainly that we have some nocturnal wasps. If you look at nocturnal bugs, um, they're, um, uh, the little ocelli on the top of their heads will tend to be a little bit bigger, but they will help detect light and dark and give the bee just 
one more way to evade predators and live a happy, healthy life. Awesome, thank you. And then what is the average life cycles of bees? Well, that kind of depends on the species. That's a very good question. Um, many will live a couple of months um, when, the, when they're out. The males tend to have shorter lifespans than the females do um, as adults. Um, the males will be around for a couple of weeks and then gradually they will just, you know, die off. The females have to stay alive to do their colonies. Um, many of our bees will overwinter as pupae. So you could say that they live for the biggest part of a year. If they are overwintering as a pupa or an adult, they come out in the following spring. So it's really kind of hard to say. I would say a couple of months is probably on average for the flight time of a female bee. I hope that I answered the question. Wonderful, thank you. And is there, as far as the bee houses, is there um, a better direction when you're setting them up? Should they point a certain way or be in a certain, certain area of the yard? Um, I've heard that facing them south is a good way um, to do. Um, so I think it's probably best. There's lots of great resources that will tell you how to do your bee, um, your bee hotel and your bee house. Um, the University or uh, North Carolina State has um, a, a guide to bee hotels and how to be a good host. And it's really extensive and it really helps. So I recommend consulting one of those guides. But I think facing them south, if I'm remembering right, um, is, is a good way to do those. Possibly east. Thank you. And... Do you know why the leaf cutter bees are green? Well, we not all leaf cutter green bees are green. Um, the ones that we have here are, tend to be gray. Um, they come in all different colors. Um, I don't know why our our sweat bees are green, and for that, I really don't know. That's an excellent question. Um, maybe they have some really neat reflected light that makes. I don't. I, I'm not. Never mind. I'm not even going to answer that because I just can't. I think they're green because they look good. They're cool. They are beautiful. That's all I got. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And we've got one more here. What are the brick-shaped items in that bee hotel? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Um, I think that you, some bees will look for cracks and rocks, and I think you can simulate those with um, with uh, with with bricks. And um, there are also cracks in between that certain bees might be able to get into. Um, that was quite the bee hotel that we saw in that that example. It had all kinds of stuff in it. Again, the type of bee hotel that you use um, has a lot to do with the kind of bees that you have around um, and what structures they're going to use. And again, that is um, something that James had covered um, in, in some detail in the Pampering Pollinators presentation that he had a couple of weeks ago. And there should be some programs coming up that'll help you a little bit more with your journey to being a bee hotelier. Thank you. Yes, we do. If you enjoyed learning about native bees with Pinellas, um, James will be doing an in-person program with us this Saturday here at Brooker, and I will put that in the chat. Um, and one more question. What was the honey you recommended? I think, was it palmetto honey? Palmetto honey. That's my favorite. I mean, all the honeys are good. Tupelo is very popular. Orange blossom is awesome. It's really sweet. But I really like the buttery taste of palmetto honey. And, and we can find it at farmer's have... markers. Perfect. At a farmer's market. Okay, well, that is all the questions we have. There are lots of thank yous coming in. You did a wonderful job, Liz. I learned a lot. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time and your expertise. And this webinar will be recorded and added to our YouTube playlist for anyone who wants to watch again later. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you for joining us. Thanks, you guys.